This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit GaryNorth.com slash free books for a free downloadable copy in PDF form of this book. Productive Christians in an Age of Guilt Manipulators, A Biblical Response to Ronald J. Sider by David Chilton, published by Institute for Christian Economics, Tyler, Texas, copyright 1981. Chapter 17, The Conquest of Poverty. There shall be no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, if only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God, to carefully observe all this commandment which I am commanding you today. Deuteronomy 15, 4, and 5. Will poverty ever be eliminated? As Moses suggests, we will be able to answer that question when we have answered these. Will God's people ever be obedient? Will there be a truly Christian culture in which Christ is recognized as Lord over everything? Many Christians today would say no. After all, we are living in the last days. Christians will soon be raptured out of the world, and Christ will then descend into judgment. Some are even saying the rapture will happen this year. This was back in 1980s, of course, 1984. But whenever it happens, we know one thing for sure. Christians are fighting a losing battle. The forces of evil will triumph until the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. We can rescue a few brands from the burning, but in this age the preaching of the gospel will fail to convert and disciple the world. Satan's power will increase. We've heard this before. If this outline of the future is correct, we can expect certain political and economic consequences to flow from such increasing depravity. Both statism and local anarchy will rise to unprecedented heights. Wars will increase. Government monetary policies will continue to produce soaring inflations and ravaging depressions. Fraud will abound, self-seeking, piggish consumption will be the norm. Men will be lazy, improvident, and undependable. The productivity of the earth will decline. The food supply will dwindle away to nothing. The outlook for conquering world poverty is bleak, to put it mildly. As ungodliness dominates the world, long-term chronic poverty will expand. Billions will starve. There will be no hope. Poverty will never be alleviated. For all we can expect is for it to grow dramatically until the return of Christ. If this outline of the future is correct. But what if it isn't correct? What if the Bible holds out the promise that before the return of Christ, the world will see a truly Christian culture? If this is what the Bible teaches, we can expect that under his blessing, the rich potential of the earth will unfold and that there shall be no poor among us. It's a nice thought, but not worth much unless there is a truly biblical basis for it. What does the Bible really teach? We have seen that the Bible does teach one of the two requisites for long-term productivity, the rule of law. But there is another thing necessary, future orientation, optimism about the future possibilities of economic growth and prosperity. The Bible teaches this as well. Christ will be victorious in this age. The gospel will convert the nations and disciple them to the obedience of God's law. And God will bless that obedience by giving worldwide peace and economic abundance. Let's consider some of the biblical evidence which leads to this conclusion. The promise of worldwide blessing. God gave Abraham the promise of the gospel in these words. Your seed shall possess the gate of his enemy." In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis twenty-two seventeen and 18. 
The seed spoken of here is Jesus Christ, Galatians 3.16. The coming of Christ was to result in the blessing of all the nations. The specific blessing mentioned here is that he will possess the gates, the centers of rule and justice and law of his enemies. The blessing that comes to the world through Christ must result in political and economic change, and this means social transformation. This promise is repeated again and again in different ways. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before thee. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-seven. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46, verse 10. All the earth will worship thee and will sing praises to thee. Psalm 66, verse 4. All nations to whom thou hast made all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and they shall glorify thy name. Psalm 86, verse 9. So the nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth thy glory. Psalm 102, verse 15. In the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established in the chief of the mountains, and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Isaiah 2, verse 2. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, verse 9. From the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is pure, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 1 verse 11. The true God will receive genuine worship from all the nations. This is certainly not to say that all men who have ever lived will be saved, nor does it suggest that at some point in the future, every single individual alive will be a Christian. But it does say that the time will come when Christianity will be the universal religion, when social structures and personal ethics will conform to biblical standards. The ruling disposition among most men will be Christian. As Abraham and the prophets contemplated this, it probably seemed even more astonishing than it seems to us. In our day, Christianity is known throughout the world. Bibles are translated into virtually every language and dialect. We are well on the way toward accomplishing God's goal of blessing all nations. But in the days of the Old Testament, such a goal would have been a would have appeared unattainable and impossible to many. One event made all the difference. That was the coming of Jesus Christ. By his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, he definitely won the victory over Satan and the forces of evil. He wrested the earth from the destroyer and extends the blessings of salvation to every nation. It is this strand of biblical evidence which we shall now examine, the victory of Jesus Christ. The very first promise of the coming Redeemer foretold his victory through suffering. God said to the serpent, On your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Genesis three, fourteen and 15. Christ's victory over the serpent would be total, and its ramifications would spill over, the prophets proclaimed, into all of life. 
it would mean victory over the nations, and even Earth's natural order would undergo significant change. Nations will see and be ashamed of all their might. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses. To the Lord our God, they will come in dread, and they will be afraid before thee. Micah seven, sixteen and 17. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Isaiah sixty five twenty five. The destruction of Satan's power began during the ministry of Christ as he cast out demons and healed the sick. One of the striking aspects of the Gospels is their record of the sudden, violent outburst of demonic activity during this period. All-out warfare was being waged. Our Lord gave to His disciples the powers of dominion over the devil, and on one occasion as they returned to Him, flushed with victory, He said, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Luke 10, 18 and 19. But it was Christ's work in his death and resurrection which effectively sealed the fate of satanic hordes. This theme runs through the apostolic letters to the early Christian assemblies. Paul wrote that, when Christ had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them in him. Colossians 2 verse 15. Jesus disarmed the demons. Can we really suppose that the world is still the devil's territory? That we can do nothing to stop his activity? He is still active, certainly, but he has been disarmed. The devil has rendered was rendered powerless. Hebrews 2:14. Satan is alive on planet Earth, but he is not well. He doesn't even have a triangle to his name. The Son of God appeared for this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3:18. Note, this is speaking of Christ's first coming, not his second coming. On the basis of Christ's victory, his people are promised in this age the same power over Satan that God foretold at the first. Paul wrote to the persecuted believers in Rome that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Romans 16:20. Our all too common timidity as we face the forces of evil is entirely unjustified. The basic victory has already been won, and our Lord has committed to us the power to shake Satan loose from his, by his hiding places. All that hinders us from dominion is our sinful unbelief in the work of Christ and the promises of God. Marcellus Kick wrote, To say that the defeat of Satan will only come through a cataclysmic act at the second coming of Christ is ridiculous in the light of these passages. To think that the church must grow weaker and weaker and the kingdom of Satan stronger and stronger is to deny that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil the first time. And it is to dishonor Christ. It is to disbelieve his word. We do not glorify God in his prophet or his prophetic word by being pessimist and defeatist. Can we be sure that it is Christ's work in this age to establish his victory throughout the world? A currently popular theory among evangelicals holds that the kingdom of Christ awaits his return when he will set up his throne in Jerusalem and reign for a thousand years. This thoroughly unbiblical idea is refuted by the passages in the following section. 
the coming of the kingdom. The psalmist wrote of the opposition between God and the heathen nations in which the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Psalm 2 verse 2. Many are in despair today as they look on the world ruled by Nimrod, Caesars, Hitlers, and Ayatollahs. Often evil conspiracies are viewed by both right and left as omnipotent forces over which there is little hope or victory. This is to place our faith in man, not God. He is the ruler of history. And the psalm goes on to celebrate the coming dominion of Christ over all the nations as universal king. God told his son, Ask of me, and I will surely give thee the nations as thy inheritance, and the ends of the earth as thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. Psalm 2, verse 8 and 9. Kings and rulers are advised by the psalmist to submit to the rule of Christ. If they do not do that, they will be destroyed. Psalm 2, 10 through 12. The reign of the Messiah is not pictured by the Old Testament writers as confined to Jerusalem. Instead, it will be universal in which all nations will serve him. Psalm 72. <coughs> this necessarily means the acceptance of his law as recorded in Scripture. The notion that Christ's kingdom has nothing to do with politics and economics is altogether false. Isaiah announced that the government will rest on his shoulders. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. When will Christ's kingdom begin? The prophet Daniel was given the answer. Interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel foretold the future of four great world empires, symbolically represented by a statue. First, there was the Babylonian Empire. It would be followed by the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and the Roman empires. But during the last empire, a stone would strike it, bringing it to destruction and becoming a, mo a mountain which would fill the earth. The stone represented the kingdom of Christ, which would endure forever. Daniel 2, 31 through 45. Because of the obvious connection of the beginning of God's kingdom with the Roman Empire, those who wish to deny it have invented the myth that we would see a revived Roman Empire in the last days. The Bible says nothing of this. But as someone has remarked, dispensationalists believe in the revival of the Roman Empire, we believe in the revival of Christianity. <coughs> Daniel goes on to show Christ ascending in the clouds to his Father and receiving everlasting dominion in order that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Daniel seven thirteen and 14. This theme is picked up by Zechariah who connects Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem just before his crucifixion with his universal rule. Premillennialist arbitrarily and quite high-handedly insert a gap of at least 2,000 years between these verses, but again without a word of biblical support. <coughs> Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you! He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Constantly the prophets told of Christ's kingdom beginning with his first coming. If this is really the case, we would expect it to be the message of the apostles as well. <clears throat> as a glance at your concordance will reveal, Christ's kingdom is a primary topic of the Gospels. 
A study of these references alone should convince you that he had no intention of postponing it at all, and contrary to the claims of Schofield and others. The authoritative interpretation of Christ's kingdom was given by Peter on the day of Pentecost. He reminded the Jews of their father David's prophecy. Because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the second coming, no, the resurrection of Christ. Acts 20, Acts chapter 2, 30 and 31. Christ became the king at his resurrection, after which he declared, All authority has been, has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. Jesus is the king right now, not in some future earthly reign. He is on David's throne right now, for that merely symbolized his heavenly throne. If Christ now has all authority in heaven and in earth, what could possibly be added to that authority in the future? Paul tells us that when God raised his son from the dead, he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet. Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is now being extended over all the earth. God has delivered us from the do domain of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians 1, 13. As members of his kingdom, Christians are ruling with him now. He has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. Revelation 1, verse 6. In his messages to the churches of Asia, Jesus exhorted each one to overcome the powers of evil in terms of their high calling as kings and priests. And he made a promise to those who obeyed using the language of Psalm 2. And he who overcomes and he who keeps his deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I received authority from my father. Revelation 2, 26 and 27. Jesus is king right now, in this age. And his obedient people have every reason to expect increasing victories in this age as they, conf as they confront the nations with the omnipotent authority of their Lord. This will not come without a struggle as the ungodly seek to retain their illegitimate hold on the world. But victory is ours in principle as we are to march forth into all the world and into every field of life, conquering in Jesus' name. Matthew sixteen eighteen, Christ promised that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, is often watered down to mean only that the church will be divinely protected against attacks by the forces of evil. Come on now. When, when have you ever heard of the gates attacking anything? Gates do not attack. Gates defend. The picture here is not that of the church besieged by the forces of evil. It's the other way around. The church is the one on the offensive. God's people are attacking the forces of evil. And Jesus promises that the ungodly will be defenseless under our attack. We will win. We share Christ's dominion now. And we are to extend that dominion throughout creation, confident of victory. Marcellus Kick said, It is true that we must not underestimate the influence and the power of the evil one. But it is also true that, that he can be easily overcome by those who believe in the power of the blood of Christ 
and are not ashamed to testify of it. They are the overcomers. How will the kingdom of Christ be established in this age? How will the prophecies of his universal dominion be fulfilled in every nation? These questions are ad- addressed in the section below. <coughs> the progress of the gospel. Just prior to his death, Jesus spoke of Satan's defeat. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. John twelve thirty one to 32 The victory over Satan is based upon the atoning work of our Savior on the cross, the proclamation of the gospel, the good news of salvation in Christ, is the means of defeating the power of the devil in every sphere of life. The combination of Christ's death and aggressive evangelism will completely root the forces of evil. It has always been so. John was told of how Christians would win the war against Satan. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to death. Revelation 12, 11. Christ's death and resurrection are the basis of victory, the foundation of his kingdom. And as we testify of him to the world, we will see the world gradually subdued by his power. It is gradual. Books such as Daniel and Revelation show us that it is a fierce struggle that often claims the lives of believers. Just as Canaan did not come without a fight, many fights in fact, so the gospel conquest of the world will require battles. It will take time. But we will win. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of of meal until it all was leavened. Matthew 13, 33. The woman didn't use dynamite to get the job done quickly. She used yeast. Similarly, God doesn't want to blow up the world. He wants to transform it. This is why Christianity is not revolutionary. Even in the face of manifest injustice, we do not overthrow the system, but overcome it by the gospel. The early Christians did not start a liberation movement against the structural injustices of the Roman Empire. They converted the empire instead. Then they changed the structures. For example, I do think it's a tragedy that worthy people do not own land. I think every Christian ought to own property. And someday I believe every Christian will own land, as we shall see further in this chapter. But socialistic land reform is not the answer. Regeneration by the gospel is the answer. As men become responsible, they will inherit the earth meekly. Meekness does not mean spinelessness. It means obedience to God and submission to his providence. Hilary Belloc wrote of the abolition of slavery that took place as Europe was Christianized. In general, you will discover no pronouncements against slavery as an institution, nor any moral definition attacking it throughout all those early Christian centuries during which it had which it nonetheless effectively disappears. Slavery disappeared because a majority of men stopped being slaves to Satan. Christianity works like leaven, from the inside out, from the bottom up. Laws, biblical laws, are important to the security of society. But if men are not ruled by law internally, individually, The external controls will break down. Our work to establish God's laws in society may and should accompany our evangelistic efforts. But apart from those efforts, we are laboring in vain and striving after wind. Dominion will come through proclaiming God's word and obeying it ourselves. 
the world will be transformed by the faithful preaching and living of God's people. On the basis of his sovereign authority, Jesus commanded, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. That command is usually misunderstood. Jesus did not say, Witness to the nations. He said, Disciple the nations. The Great Commission is not exhausted when we have brought the gospel to the attention of all nations. That is not even half the battle. It is only the beginning. We must disciple all nations to the obedience of his commandments, and that can come only as we ourselves are discipled to God's law. Only disciples can make disciples. Hybrids cannot reproduce. But as we ourselves submit to Christ and his holy law, the nations will also. The subduing of the nations to the discipleship of Christ will take place as we are faithfully obedient. That is the crucial issue and that is why Christians have lost ground over the recent past. (laughs) It is not due to the advance of paganism. Remember, the gates can't advance. It is due only to the retreat of Christians. That there is still a remnant of paganism in this world is chiefly the fault of the church. The word of God is just as powerful in this generation as it was during the early history of the church. The power of the gospel is just as strong in this century as in the days of the Reformation. These enemies could be completely vanquished if the Christians of this day and age were as vigorous, as bold, as earnest, as prayerful, and as faithful as Christians were in the first several centuries and in the time of the Reformation. Thus we must work diligently and patiently for the kingdom of God. It has come, it is here, and it is still coming. In the meantime, we are not to envy even the wicked who are in power. They will fall, and the meek will inherit the earth. Psalm 37. The gradual growth of Christ's kingdom was stated beautifully by Benjamin Warfield. Through all the years, one increasing purpose runs, one increasing purpose. The kingdoms of this earth become ever more and more the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. The process may be slow. The progress may appear to our impatient eyes to lag. But it is God who is building, and under his hands the structure rises as steadily as it does slowly. And in due time the capstone shall be set into its place, and to our astonished eyes shall be revealed nothing less than a saved world. The Blessings of National Obedience We have noted the cultural effects of obedience so often in our study that it would be superfluous to recount them all here. But this chapter is on the elimination of poverty as the result of obedience to God's law. And I want to use that subject to bring together the various strands of biblical revelation which we have considered here. We have seen that worldwide blessing is promised in Christ. That when he came, he was victorious. That his victory continues throughout the earth as his kingdom expands. And that the expansion of his kingdom follows the fearless delivery of the gospel into all nations. From what we have studied in previous chapters, it should be clear that the reign of Christ in the hearts and social structures of men will produce responsibility and freedom under the law of God. As men mature in this responsibility and freedom, they will be granted more. Matthew 25, 21, and 23. With the increased work, savings, and capital investment, Productivity will rise, creating more capital for investment, and so on. There will be uninterrupted growth over time until the last day, and poverty will disappear. Those who remain ungodly will be disinherited, 
as God's providential forces in history work against them. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Proverbs 13.22 God's people will inherit land as we mature, as we submit ourselves to biblical law and extend its implications all through society. The biblical statement of the elimination of poverty is found in Micah 4, 2 through 4, which speaks of the blessings of the nations that are converted and thus submit to the law of God. And many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. And never again will they train for war. And each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. As obedience to biblical law spreads, capital will be shifted from warfare to more productive endeavors. And as productivity rises, we find each man on his own property, sitting under his vine and fig tree. This is the direction of history. Men will become more obedient, hence more responsible, hence more productive, hence more capitalized. The Bible shows that poverty will be abolished through godly productivity and rising real wealth. The biblical answer is not, as the saying goes, to redistribute the pie, but to make a bigger pie. It can happen. Moreover, it will happen. Ultimately, poverty has no future except for the ungodly who are dispossessed. Ezekiel's vision of the kingdom's growth throughout the world, symbolized by the gradually rising stream flowing from the temple of God, Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12, showed the blessings of God affecting virtually everything in life bringing health and prosperity to the world. Even the salty Dead Sea, the symbol of God's curse upon Sodom and Gomorrah, will become fresh water, but some few places will be left for salt. Verses 8 through 11. Still under the judgment of God, because of their rebellion against God. The Bible looks forward to the time when none of God's people will be, will be poor, when by God's gracious providence, the land will be distributed to all those who are obedient to his law. This will never come about through ungodly acts of expropriation. It will never happen as long as the church continues to heed unbiblical philosophies which seek to turn her away from obedience to God's law. Institutional poverty will never be cured by socialism and statism. Ungodliness can only extend the curse. The conquest of poverty is not really based on the issue of poverty at all. It is an issue of of obedience, of godliness, of submission to the Lord Christ at all points. Our nation has a Christian heritage. While they had their flaws, the Puritans and the leaders of the young United States knew the importance of biblical laws and that righteousness exalts a nation. Proverbs 14.34 Their adherence to God's word was blessed by God, and our land became one of increasing wealth, but we fell into the snare warned of in Deuteronomy 8. We looked at our peace and prosperity and convinced ourselves that our strength had come from ourselves. We began to seek growth for ourselves, And not for the glory of God, we rejoiced in the gifts and ignored the giver. We used his tools to build idols while we boasted of freedom and we became enslaved. 
When God's goodness does not lead to repentance, He chastises us. He sent judgments to our nation to turn us from our sins. And as we felt our power eroding, we turned more and more towards sin as a means of strength. We allowed our rulers to lead us into many wars in order to achieve a supremacy that is denied to all but the obedient. We increasingly deified the state, ascribing to it creative powers, abandoning the biblical standards in one area after another. We coveted goods and got credit expansion. We wanted business booms and the state provided them. Our demands increased and the dominance of our new God was enlarged to keep up with them. And as our nation became enslaved, the Christians ran, some to the security of fundamentalist retreat, some to the comfort of liberal compromise, some to the heretical moderation of hovering somewhere in between. Every avenue was tried but the way of simple obedience. And everything backfired. Our wars reduced our population. Our foreign aid produced contempt and envy. Our foreign policies generated revolutions abroad and riots at home. Our welfare resulted in poverty and dependence. Our economic booms terminated in racking depressions. Our energy policies caused shortages. Our evangelistic campaigns strewed a generation of carnal Christians across the land. And inflation accompanied it all. The curse became a part of everyday life. So we sought for new solutions. In a fruitless attempt to avoid the consequences of apostasy without repenting of sin. And our new solutions have bound us in chains stronger than those we had before. From national pride we have sunk into national guilt. We once bragged about God's blessings, we now feel ashamed of them. Our freedom has become an unstable anarchy. Our stability has resulted in stagnation. God has judged. And in the midst of all this, Ronald Sider and the Christian Socialist have appeared as God's scourges of further chastisement. And a disobedient antinomian church has blindly followed them into the ditch. Christian organizations abandoning God's law have endorsed statism as the cure for our diseases. The moral fiber of our country, made strong by obedience, has rotted away in envy and guilt. Culturally and psychologically, we have committed suicide, and our sins will be visited upon our great-grandchildren. The wrath of God is evident in our seduction of shoddy, morally bankrupt misanthropes. Our future, if the spokesman for salvation by suicide or any indication of it, will be a downward spiral into self-absorption, slavery, despair, and damnation. And yet we still have our Bibles in many translations. We still have our homes we still have a considerable remainder of the rule of law, capital of all kinds with which to build. But will we repent? I am just enough of an optimist to hope that we will yet turn back to God and begin again the construction of Christian culture based on biblical law. What can be learned from the experience of the revolutionary era? That man without God, even with the circumstances in his favor, can do nothing but work his own destruction. Man must break out of the vicious revolutionary circle. He must turn back to God, whose truth alone can resist the power of the lie. Should anyone consider this momentous lesson of history to be more sentimental lament than advice for politics, he is forgetting that the power of the gospel to affect order and freedom and prosperity, has been substantiated by the world history. Let him bear in mind that whatever is useful and beneficial to man is promoted by the fear of God and thwarted by the denial of God. 
he should bear in mind especially that the revolutionary theory was an unfolding of the germ of unbelief and that the poisonous plant, which was cultivated by apostasy from the faith, will wilt and choke in the atmosphere of a, of a revival of the faith. That is the reason for this book. It is written to encourage and return a return to Scripture, to stir into flame the embers of godly principles which form our great heritage, and which will lead again to dominion under God's law. The status cannot ultimately prevail, and dark as it looks, they have not yet won the present battle. By the grace of God, we can still change the drift of our culture. God has given us the tools and guaranteed our success if we obey. As Hilary Bellock observed, there is a complex knot of forces underlying any nation once Christian, a smoldering of the old fires. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.